Well, good morning, and thank you for joining us this morning. You guys are in for a real treat with some kids that we have joining us to help lead you in worship. Um, we are in our fourth week of Advent, which we'll celebrate, and we are just excited, and we hope you are too. We know that this time of year can bring chaos and stress, um, but we believe that uh, it also brings a lot of joy and peace in our lives if we allow it. So would you stand with us as we uh, sing joyfully this morning? on Advent. So I'm going to invite Tom and Diane Gouge up to the stage, and also I'm going to be inviting some of the kids who will be doing the praise and worship with us right after. And so if you would come up, um, welcome Tom and Diane Gouge, and they will do the fourth week of Advent. Good morning, church. Uh, together we're Tom and Diane Gouge, and we've been attending church here for I don't know, 20 plus years anyway. Uh, we're also active in the Cal, the Connect on Wednesday, and we're also the founders of Tamani World Children Project. And it's, that happens to be one of CLC's strategic partners. On the fourth Sunday of Advent, we reach the culmination of love. The Messiah comes in love and righteousness. The angels filled the sky with the greatest news of love. They visited the lowest of the lows in Jewish society, the shepherds, with the most amazing birth announcement. This love is no respecter of persons, but is for all who receive. As we light the four candles, we ponder, for God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whoever believes in him 
should not perish, but have eternal life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. John 3, 16 and 17. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to the God. praising together, would you? Go tell it on the mountain Over the hills and everywhere Go tell it on the mountain That Jesus Christ is born While shepherds kept me watching for a silent fox by night Behold throughout the heaven 
encouraged to go out in the world and praise Jesus in front of all of them, right? Because he's the savior of the world. So would you pray with me this morning? Oh, Jesus, we give you all glory, honor, and praise this morning. And just ask that, that love that you have for all of us, that we'd feel it today, that you'd fill our hearts with the culmination of love, like we said in the Advent reading, with your joy, with your peace, Lord. I just ask that your spirit would fall upon this place that the love of the Savior would set people free today to walk in freedom. And God, we just give you thanks for all that you've done, all that you do, and all that you will do forever and ever. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. Hey church, how are we doing today? Hey, welcome to the Christian Life Center. We're so, so grateful that you are here. If you're in the sanctuary, maybe you're in the parking lot in your car, or maybe you're tuning in from home, whatever it might be. Thanks so much for being here and joining us as a church family. Uh, hey, uh, at this time, I want to go ahead and dismiss our youngest congregants, our middle school students, and our kids. You guys can go ahead to your Sunday school classes. And for the rest of you, I got a couple of announcements that I'd like to share with you. Now this Friday, 
Whether you like it or not, whether you are ready or not, is Christmas Eve, right? And we want to extend a warm invitation to you and your family and friends to join us here at the Christian Life Center for our Christmas Eve services. Now, we have two services that we're doing, one at 5 o'clock and one at 7 p.m. Both of them will take place right here in the sanctuary. Or if you'd like, you can tune in from home online and watch it live. Or if you'd like to join us right in the parking lot, we'll be live streaming it to our parking lot. Now, I did want to mention a couple things about this service. Uh, that evening, we will not be having nursery care and we will not be having our Kids Zone program, but we have something better. Instead, we are extending an invitation to the kids to join us right here in the sanctuary for that service. We are actually building this service with kids in mind. And so we invite them and we invite you to invite them to join us for our services that evening. They will even get to see Miss Megan as Miss Megan shares from the stage. So that's going to happen that evening. And then one last thing that's going to happen is we're we're actually going to be able to sing some songs to candlelight. And so it's going to be a beautiful moment where we as a church can celebrate what God has done and what God is doing through his son, Jesus. And so we invite you, bring your family along, bring some friends along for this evening as we celebrate together. Now, two days after Christmas Eve is Sunday, December 26th. And so I wanted to mention, we're actually going to be home for the holidays on that Sunday. We're not going to be meeting here in the building, but instead all of our services will be online that day. So don't show up at the building or you might be by yourself, or maybe you'll find that you're with someone else who also forgot that we're not in the building that day. Instead, go ahead and tune in online and join us for that service. And we're doing this in part to give our volunteers a break and then to let our families, our CLC families hang out and spend time together with their families as they join their CLC family virtually that day. So that's the 26th. Don't show up here at the building. And then the last thing I want to mention is our semester of cow has come to an end. And so there's going to be no cow on December 22nd or December 29th. Instead, we're going to start it back up in the new year. Now there is one class that is continuing actually on the 22nd. It is our advent class. So people can still come out to that, but there will not be any meal or anything like that. But instead, we invite you to join us in the new year as we kick off this new season of what God is doing at the Christian Life Center. Now, to learn more about that, all you have to do is go to clcfamily.church slash cow. And if you want to learn more about anything that is happening at the church, all you have to do is go to clcfamily.church slash news, and you can sign up for our newsletter. Huh, I know that was a lot. We're going to go ahead and continue on in our service now. And I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to Ben for week three of our series, Christmas Checklist. Well, hey, everyone, and welcome again to the Christian Life Center. We're so glad that you're here. Uh, as Christian just said, my name is Ben. If we haven't had the opportunity of meeting, um, welcome. I'm glad that you're here. I have the privilege of being able to work on staff, and I'm excited to be able to share with you today as we continue in our Christmas checklist series. Basically, this is a sub-series of Luke. If you are brand new with us, we have been working through the book of Luke for um, over a year and a half, and we are continuing through that. And we do sub-series to kind of help us remember where we're at, also to kind of change it up a little bit, the scenery, make it a little bit more uh, appealing and memorable as we work through the book of Luke. So we are talking about Christmas checklist, and man... Less than a week. Are you guys okay? Are you feeling all right? Like, I'm feeling a little stressed out. I'm feeling a little bit of pressure. I'm feeling like there's a lot of things that have to happen yet, and I haven't even started to think about half of those things. Um, but we are excited to continue in this series, and there's just something about the Christmas season that brings a lot of chaos or stress. It, it, depending on where you're at, you might identify it as something different than that, but like uh, there's a lot that usually happens right around Christmas and New Year's. I don't know if it's kind of like the combination of the year coming to a close, uh, you know, the break from school. There's a lot of different Christmas and holiday themed things that are happening around, but it just seems like life gets a little bit chaotic and crazy during the season. Does anybody know what I'm talking about? Is any, okay, good. Like, at least three of you. Um, so w w as we go through this Christmas checklist, what we wanted to do is trying to encourage you that as you go through all of the different things this season, as you make checklists, presumably for, you know, Christmas parties or Christmas cards or to, to your shopping list for, for kids or for family or for friends, as you make all of these different lists, there was a couple things that as we worked through Luke, we wanted to remind you to be uh, considerate of, to, to remember in this season. And that's what we're kind of continuing with today as we hope, I, I hope to be able to communicate well to you today that you would 
Uh, just not let this season be one of just simple busyness, but in this, you would actually pause to accept and receive God's gift of righteousness that he offers to us. That you wouldn't try and earn that on your own, that you wouldn't try and kind of have this idea of, of a, a works-based righteousness, but that you would just accept this gift-based right, righteousness where Jesus gives us this righteousness to the Father and we can be in right standing with God. And that's what I hope to really challenge you with today. And as we've worked through this series the first week, we kind of encourage you to have an expectation as you go through this series. Last week, we talked about persistence because persistence in prayer and in faith actually grows our faith. And so today I wanna to continue in this series and talk about accepting God's free, loving gift that he offers and bestows to us. But like I said, this, this season is one that is full of, of chaos. It just seems like there's one that there, there's a lot going on. Um, I don't know about you, but uh, I, I always feel that. And today, this year, I feel like it was especially um, evident the day right after Thanksgiving. So the day after Thanksgiving, it's Black Friday. I was going out with my, my parents. Hope and I were visiting my family up in Rhode Island. And we went to this restaurant. And as soon as we walked into the door, there was this sign. And I don't remember the exact words, but it was something about there's only 29 days left till Christmas. And here I am the day after Thanksgiving, the day after Thanksgiving, finally wrapping my mind around the idea of like, hey, it's Thanksgiving. Like it was a day past and I'm going, yeah, we should be thankful and, and be remembering. And as soon as I saw that sign, it was kind of like a, a gut check. Like, oh my gosh, there's only 29 days. There's so much to do in this time and in this season. And like I've kind of already posed this question, how, how, how many of you have maybe thought about why or what it is that is about this season that creates this kind of chaos and this, this rapid flurry of, of motion and things that are happening and sets things like you, you've got to do this and this and this. Like, has anybody ever really thought through that? And then on top of that, kind of my question personally is more of going, how do you personally manage that? Like how, as you go through these seasons, as it doesn't seem to get easier year after year, but it gets more harder and difficult year after year, how do you manage that expectation or that pressure? And I'm just curious, like this is more of a, a pondering question that I would love for you to kind of work through. If you want to share with me, I'll take it. But I can tell you what I do in this season to kind of manage the pressure and the expectation is I tend to say no to a lot of different things that are happening in the season. Like, I, I just don't say yes to everything because it gets too chaotic that I just simply can't say yes to everything. There's a couple different things, like, for example, that I specifically say no to. One of them would be, like, outside or outdoor, like, lights and setting up, like, ornaments and decoration outside. Like, how many people here love that? Christian showed us a picture before Thanksgiving even was here of his lights that he had decorated, and I was like, wow, he's an overachiever. But, like, how many of you are just like, man, you love setting up the lights? I love to look at lights. I love to go around and see the different houses. But personally, I want nothing to do with that, okay? Just the idea of setting something up and then in like four or five, maybe six weeks later, I have to go back out and tear it down. That's just a lot of work. And then on top of that, my wife and I cannot agree on the same color of what light should be. Um, and I do want to take a poll right now, just out of curiosity. Are there any women in here that think that Christmas lights should actually have color? Is there any women in the, okay, yeah, sweet. I was hoping for that. Now I'm curious, is there any men that actually think Christmas lights should be white and only white? Men? All right, all right, all right, so good. See, this is the debate in our house. It's either color or, or white. And it, yeah, it's just a debate. We can't agree on it. Another thing that I tend to say no to um, is Christmas cards, okay? So if you happen to get a Christmas card from the Dieterly household, um, know two things, okay? Number one, I had absolutely nothing to do with that, okay? Like, I barely even posed for the picture if there's a picture on there, okay? A and then number two, you should consider yourself incredibly lucky because I just don't want to work through any type of list and who gets it and who doesn't. So I leave that all to my wife. So if you know me and you're expecting a card from me, it's not going to happen, okay? So if you get one, consider yourself lucky. That's just one of the areas that I say no to. The other area that I really, really want to say no to is the area of, of actually wrapping presents, okay? 
I don't want to do it. It's just a lot of time. And for me, it's a lot of tape and a lot of cuts that I shouldn't have made and then rewrapping the present that I just spent 20 minutes wrapping, okay? I, I have taken it to the degree that I have lobbied to Hope, my wife, that we should actually not wrap presents kind of using economical resource, like for economical purposes, we shouldn't actually use wrapping paper. I've tried to argue that, that didn't go so well. Um, and then I went the other direction, and even though it's not really cost effective, I've tried to argue that duct tape is an effective means of gift wrap. That one didn't land either. And then I just kind of went the whole Amazon package route of going, all right, well, we should just leave the boxes. The boxes are gift enough. You can just open the box. There's no sense of me. And, and that didn't. If you're curious how all of this is going, let me just tell you that the lights at my house are still white. I had to drop off Christmas cards this past week. And uh, sometime this week, I have to actually wrap all of the gift presents. So in my opinion, it is very one-sided, OK? So I just say that for sympathy. If you don't have sympathy, you can just ignore that, I guess. But there is a lot going on. And to manage it, I tend to say no to things. But in this time and in this season, one of the things that is exciting is to actually receive a gift right? Like, how many of you, and this is, don't worry, I'm not going to, like, set you up for failure and then go, oh, you're all materialistic. How many of you actually like to receive presents or gifts? Uh, according to Gary Chapman, he's an author, he wrote the book Five Love Languages, gifts is actually one of the primary ways that he argues that some actually feel loved and valued and cared for. So this is not actually like a diss, but there's something about receiving a gift or a present that there's an excitement in it, there's a hope and an expectation, there's something in receiving a gift that can be exciting. And really what I'm doing is I'm trying to set this up and talk to you about, again, this idea of gifts, gift-based righteousness, where it's not on our own merit, it's not on our own work, it's not on what we do, but it's on the fact that we simply receive God's gift and his love and his righteousness, and that is imputed to us. And so as we're looking through this, as you receive gifts, there was a, actually even a, an illustration a couple years ago. Um, it was around Christmas time or it was right before the Christmas season. Um, somebody here gave me a gift that was based off of one of the illustrations that I used. It was, it was a small silver dollar. I had an illustration where I talked about silver dollars and I just mentioned that I had never seen one before. And somebody actually gifted me a silver dollar in a, in a nice little um, uh, case for it. And man, I tell you what, that, I was so honored by that gift, not only because of the gift, but because it communicated that they had heard that message and then it landed. And I was just so flattered and honored. And I cherished that thing for at least four weeks before I spent it. And uh, <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. I didn't, I didn't spend it. It's sitting on my, my, in one of my bookshelves at home. But uh, there's just something about a gift that, that is, is, it can be exciting. And, and uh, what I really want to drive home is this idea, again, what I just mentioned, is that we have to receive God's gift of righteousness. We have to actually accept it. So on your Christmas checklist, as you're doing your final preparations for Christmas, as you're preparing for everything, as you're getting ready, man, I want you to receive and to accept God's free gift of righteousness. I want you to be mindful of that as you're going about the hustle and bustle of this holiday season receive and accept and be aware of his loving gift that he offers. And, and really, that's what the, the main point of what today's message is. And we're going to jump into it. We'll get into a lot of different things that are going, uh, going on in this passage. We're going to be continuing in Luke chapter 18 as we continue through uh, this passage and talk through this parable. But in order for a gift to be a gift is, again, this idea that you have to receive this gift, right? Like if somebody offers you a gift and then you offer to pay for that gift, it is no longer a gift, right? Now, now it's just something that you purchased. It's something that you own. Or if you've bartered for something or you've traded for something, the second that you start that, it actually is no longer a gift. The only thing that you can actually do with a gift is receive and accept a gift. There's nothing that you do to earn a gift because that's kind of, again, this idea of work that you earned it and somebody gave you this, but a gift is something that you simply receive. But if you do something like you work, you trade, you barter, you negotiate, you strike a deal, you build it or create it, then that thing that you receive, again, is no longer a gift. Instead, it's a payment or it's a result of your work. It's a commodity or it's a creation. It's something that you've made, but it's no longer a gift. You have to receive it. 
And, and I would say that if you've ever done this in, in your interactions with people, if you've ever offered to, to pay for something that somebody is trying to gift to you, generally it kind of cheapens it, right? Like it, it kind of could offend without maybe even meaning to, you could offend somebody because it's a gift. They wanted to show you love and care and concern. And if you offer to pay for it, it's no longer a gift and that can be offensive. And so as we work through this today, I want you to see the difference between these two men that Jesus is going to talk about in this parable in Luke chapter 18. We're going to see two completely different types of people, right? Like two polar opposite examples. And really what Jesus is doing is he's pulling out in this, this idea that we need to walk in humility and that we need to not be focused on works-based righteousness, but we need to be focused on gifts a gift-based righteousness, meaning we receive and accept the gift that God gives. And that's what we're going to see. Let, let me just say a quick word of prayer. We'll jump into this. We'll get into the text, and we'll work through this passage. So, Heavenly Father, I thank you so much for this day. Lord, I thank you that we get this opportunity to come before you, that, Lord, in the midst of the, the hustle and bustle of the year coming to an end and the year where Christmas, or in the week that Christmas is just right around the corner, Lord, I thank you that we get to pause and to reflect on you. Father, I pray that my words would not be my words today, but you would just speak through me and that I would just simply be an instrument or a tool in your hands. Lord God, that you would just speak whatever you would have your children hear. Uh, Lord, we thank you for this day. We thank you for this time. In Jesus' name, amen. And like I said, sorry, I have a piece of ice, so if you hear crunching, that's why. Um, at, like I said, we are going to be working through Luke chapter 18, and this is kind of a continuation of where we were last week. If, if you want to, you can see online later on or in a bit. Like If you go to our website, our media page has all of our messages, but this is kind of a continuation of a lesson that Jesus is talking to his disciples and teaching them about prayer teaching them the importance of being persistent in prayer. And so we continue on, we get to Luke chapter 18, and we're going to start in verse 9. And this is where it kind of changes scenes a little bit. And it actually expresses Luke, the author of Luke, actually tells us why Jesus is at, about to give this parable that we're going to look at in a deeper measure. It says this, Luke 18, verse 9, it says, He also told this parable, to some who trusted in themselves that they were righteous and treated others with contempt. Now, if you've been with us through this, ser uh, this series, like if you've been with us for any amount of time, you recognize right away that this is just kind of a continued campaign against the Pharisees, the Sadducees, the religious leaders of the time, right? Like, it feels like every time that I get up to communicate and every time I I'm standing up here, we're talking about the Pharisees on some level. Like, here they are. They missed it again. They've missed it because of pride. They've missed it because they're looking for the place of honor and, and they want all of these things. Like, this is something that we have talked about time and time and time again. This is something that Luke consistently brings up. And so as we look at this, Jesus is just kind of at it again, if you will. He, he's traveling, he's ministering, he's talking about what the kingdom of heaven is like. He's eventually making his way into Jerusalem. But right now, he's just kind of slowly going from town to town, from place to place, talking about the kingdom. He's teaching his disciples in this season, but also as the opposition arises, as he sees and interacts with the religious elite, Jesus is also taking the time, I would argue, to show grace and mercy to those that are missing it and to show the error of their ways. So I think every time that we see in Luke where, where Jesus is actually taking time to correct or to confront these religious elite, again, he is showing mercy. He is appealing to them that they would see and understand that they are missing the kingdom of heaven because it was completely opposite from what they expected. And so Jesus is teaching, and he's going through, he's continuing this camp campaign, and the Jewish religious leaders had this religious system where they took the laws that God had given them in the Old Testament, and they added laws on top of laws on top of laws, and they were all these man-made laws that were added to the laws that God gave, and it was this huge legalistic system that you could never actually be good enough for. 
they, they just argued that you had to do all of these things and not do all of these things. And to not do the things that you shouldn't do, you should probably do or not do this thing. And so to not do this thing, you shouldn't do this thing, but maybe even we should build another wall on top of that wall that prevents us from that wall that we go, you shouldn't do this so that you don't get to this and you don't get to this. And it was just this baffling weight, this burden that people would try and carry, trying to have a way that they had access to God through the law, but the law was never the way that they would actually approach God fully. See, as God gave the law to Moses in the Old Testament, he knew that Jesus would be coming and that Jesus would be the fulfillment of the law. The law only pointed to Jesus coming, and now as Jesus is here, his kingdom has come, he is now revealing and teaching and sharing that things have changed. But the religious elite didn't get it. They weren't there. They couldn't follow. They weren't in that place where they could do it. So Jesus, having seen this numerous times, again confronts those that think that they're righteous on their own, and they treat others with contempt. And he says this parable, um, kind of explaining two different men. Verse 10 says this. It says, Two men went up into the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. What we're going to see in this parable is that there is a very sharp contrast between the religious Pharisee and then for the tax collector. And there was socially a huge gap between these two. So tax collectors were despised, they were hated, they basically stole from their neighbors, and then the religious elite were exactly that. They were more prominent and more, uh, most likely they were probably wealthy from the, the uh, favor that they had from other people and, and for manipulating and making rules that kind of benefited them. And so you have these two polar opposite people. And what I wanna do is uh, I, I have brought a few friends today um, a couple weeks ago, or actually at this point, it was probably a couple months ago, um, I used some G.I. Joes as an illustration. And uh, I, in my 16 years of communicating, I don't think I've ever had an illustration follow me around as much as using G.I. Joes has, okay? So today, I'm going to use them again, but there's a specific purpose for that. And I'm also going to introduce you to a, a new fun character, hopefully fun and not. But they are here for a purpose to help me understand. And I do want to say that after I, I like made these guys show up, Christian started to talk a lot about the G.I. Joes. Did anybody else catch this? Like, he started to say that I would, like, play with him in the office and, like, uh, that I just wanted to be around him all the time. I'm not really sure, but it sounds like Christian's kind of deflecting there, isn't it? Like, in fact, I think he might have used and talked about my G.I. Joes more than I actually did. All I know is that the last time he asked to use them, um, he wanted it from Sunday into Monday, so he kind of had a sleepover with the G.I. Joe. So you can say what you want, Christian, but I, I, we're a little concerned for you, actually. But uh, we, we're going to kind of model two different things. Oh, and I, I forgot, as I was talking about a gift, I was going to show you this. This is my solution this year. The, does anybody know what this is? This is a gift wrap Amazon package. This is my solution this year. Like, the jury still hasn't come back. Like, the judge hasn't ruled on this yet. But if this works, I just, for the next few years, buy a couple bags, stick the gifts in there, and I don't have to do any type of gift wrapping. Isn't that awesome? Sorry. Anyway, that was supposed to be there earlier. But let me get Joe out. So you guys know Joe. This is Joe. He's got no other name other than Joe. This is his name. He is going to represent our Pharisee today, okay? Because he has in the past, he is a Pharisee. Let's see if he stands. He doesn't stand, so we're just going to sit him down. And then the other person that we're going to do, it's a little bit smaller, but we have also got Lego Man. Lego Man uh, specifically, his full name is uh, Aircraft Mechanic Lego Man, um, but that's a lot to say, so we're just going to call him Lego Man. Lego Man here is going to represent the tax collector, okay? Part of the reason he's representing the tax collector is because he's got a lot of stuff with him. If you see, he's got his little cart there with tools in it. That, that basically is uh, a, an example of how the Pharisees had a lot of different things. Because they had ripped off the people that were around them, they had a lot of possessions. So here's our little tax collector, or he's actually Lego man. He is going to represent the, uh, let's make sure that he's standing there. He is going to represent the tax collectors in this. And so again, I'm wanting to give you a little bit of background. What we know is that Pharisees were the kind of the, the prominent figures of that, of that day. While they had no actual um, 
no governmental influence. What they did have influence on and over was the way that a Jew would kind of enter into the temple, how they would actually come before God and how they would have to do those steps and those processes. Yes, there was the law, but again, they had written law on top of law that would change and alter the way that somebody would approach the temple. So while there's no actual government affiliation here, they were prominent, powerful people kind of changed and dictated how a normal person, how a normal Jew would be able to interact with the God of the universe. So there was prominence there and there was position there. There was power there. There was authority. There was this belief that because they were so good that they were the only ones that were right and and were able to access God because of their righteousness. What we know and what we see, it's because it was a self-righteousness that they thought that they were good, but they were the ones that were actually missing it. This is what Jesus talks about time and time and time and time again. Like, again, this confrontation that you see with with these Pharisees is because they missed it time and time and time again. And then what we have is the tax collector. The tax collector was despised by everyone. Like I said, they would basically, the way that it would work is that if if you, there would be a, a, um, a law or a tax that would need to be collected, a Roman citizen would be able to bid on that area or certain region and say, I can collect X amount of dollars from this region. And if they won that bid, what that Roman citizen would do was then hire people from that area to collect the money. They were the tax collectors. And basically what these tax collectors would do is that they would go to their friends, their family, their neighbors, their their people that they grew up with, and they would collect the required taxes, but not just the required taxes. They would also take money on top of that. So they became rich off of the backs of their friends, their family, their neighbors, their countrymen. And so they were despised. They were hated, even in a bracket that was below sinner. Sinner was here, tax collector was here. They were the worst of the worst. The Jews considered them to be so dishonest that they would not be able to testify in court. Like, even I read something that said this, that said the Jews or or the tax collectors were so despised that they would not, that the Jewish like leaders would not accept their money in the temple. You know you've got to be really bad when the church won't accept your money. So the tax collectors were despised. They were hated. And what you see is a contrast of two people. As Jesus tells this parable, he's setting it up in such a way that you're going to see these two people and right away the listeners back then and hopefully for us today go, wow, that's a huge gap between where these two people live. There's a huge difference between our Pharisee here who's kind of got it together, at least that's what they claim and that's what we see, and then this tax collector who's missing it, who's a crook and a robber, a thief. He just gets rich basically off everybody else. And so we're going to continue in this passage. So two men, they go up. A Pharisee, uh, I wrote this in my notes, says the Pharisee and religious leaders who saw themselves as only righteous ones, they were the only righteous ones enough to be accepted by God. And so what we see is this in Luke 18 verses 11 and 12, it says this, the Pharisee standing by himself prayed thus, I thank you that God, I thank you that I am not like other men, extortionists, unjust, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week. I give tithes of all that I get. And and as you read through this, like one of the things that if you have any social skills, like as you read this, as you first kind of see what's going on, it's your probably first thought is going, wow, that's pretty gutsy. Like who would actually pray that prayer? Like, oh God, I'm so thankful that I am so awesome and that I'm not like losers and this guy and this weirdo over here. Like we probably wouldn't do that. And again, this is a made up story. So what I don't know is that as Jesus is telling this parable, this made up story, is Jesus actually like saying this and there's some shock value in that? Like he's, he's drawing the people in that these Pharisees wouldn't ever actually pray that out loud or think that they wouldn't do that. It's just in their their secret actions that they that they do that or what we see is that the pharisees are pretty bold maybe this is even like that maybe they do actually claim and think that they are that much better than other people especially lowly people like tax collectors and so he, he says this and and jesus is making this up um 
Jewish people in that day also would have considered uh, uh, considered a religious leader to be, um, they would have considered him as he starts to talk to God and say, thank you, God, for this. They would have seen that this religious leader was pious, and it would be normal for them to think that it would be okay to thank God for being so pious, to be so religiously devoted. They would say that, oh, there's nothing really that bad. I think part of what we've got going on is that in our mind, society, I think the gospel has impacted and invaded our world in such a level that we do kind of consider it a social understanding. Like if you have social awareness, you're going to kind of go, man, that would be really rude. But I think in this time, in this season, it was different. I think that they maybe just thought that they were that much better and they weren't afraid to share it and to say it. And then, like I said, what I started to just say, the hearers of this parable wouldn't think that Pharisee was boastful by doing this, but rather grateful to God to be so religiously devoted. Jewish people considered it pious to thank God for one's righteousness. And so this is what happens. He, Joe over here, the Pharisee gets up and he's going, oh God, God, mm, God, it's great to talk to you, God. Um, I just wanted to thank you um, that I am so awesome. Like, I'm really great. And uh, I'm not like other people that like lie and steal and cheat and, and destroy. And I'm definitely not like uh, that guy over there. That guy's a loser. We, we both know that. But uh, we are so thankful. Like, and, and I'm going to embellish this a little bit because I've got Joe here, okay? And he's going to go, God, I thank you that I'm so just perfectly poised. I, I'm just like so symmetrical. My hands match. I, I'm thankful that I can, I'm posable. I'm a military action figure and I'm posable. I'm like that guy over there where he just either sits or stands or he has to hold on to other Legos. But I'm just so grateful and thankful that I have all of this stuff and I am so good. Oh, and by the way, let me tell you, let me, let me tell you, God, let me tell you how good I am. <laughs> I, I fast, right? Like I fast twice a week like that's that's good because you know you know like in the old testament like the day of atonement we're all supposed to fast but that's once a year i do it like twice a week that's like it's like over a hundred times more than what i need to do but i'm i'm pretty it's a, oh don't worry yeah it's all good god like i got this and then he's also going to say that he tithes and his tithing is not just like on his flocks and on his crops because that was what was required for tithing. He's going to go, no, 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 God, even the product of my flock, like, like eggs and milk and cheese, <laughs> I'm so good that I even tithe that stuff. You don't require it, but I tithe that stuff. So he is really full of himself. He's really thinking that he is justified, that he's good, that he's comparing himself to somebody who is lowly and worthless by his guesstimation and his opinion. And so he's talking through that. There's a, a commentary that I wanted to read to you. It's the NIV application commentary. And I'm going to read it a couple times because I had some really great thoughts on that. It says this. It says, The Pharisee approaches God boldly and begins what looks like a praise psalm. God, or I thank you, God, and in this type of psalm, the petitioner usually thanks God for something that God has done or some blessing that he has provided. But this Pharisee is grateful for himself, that he is not like other sinners, such as robbers, evildoers, adulterers, or even tax collector. He honors God by fasting voluntarily twice a week and by tithing. Such a fast included only bread and water. Since it is above and beyond the call of duty, the Pharisee wears it as a badge of achievement and should cause God to give him favor. Tithing means that one-tenth of the Pharisee's earnings went to God, or went to the Lord, but his prayer is actually a distortion of the praise psalm. Because when the Pharisee's done, his prayer, in effect, is, I thank you, God, that I am so great. In fact, he get, one gets the impression that God should be honored that this faithful Pharisee is on his team. Five times in two verses, he uses the first person pr uh, singular pronoun, making himself the major subject of the prayer. He even puts down the tax collector, praying besides him, referring to him negatively as this tax collector. And so here is this, this scene that Jesus is kind of making this story up where this tax collector is just looking down. He's despising. He is hating on. He is rejecting. He is just kind of saying how good he is. He's using all of his works and all of his deeds to make an argument to God himself that he should be justified and righteous before God. He's making this argument like, 
If you ever find yourself in a place where you are praying, you're actually making an argument to God about how righteous you are, you should probably stop praying, all right? It doesn't work out that well. So he is making an argument to God of saying why he, he deserves and why he's so great and so good and that he has earned salvation basically in and of his own work. And he's missing the point there. Uh, we already talked about the fasting was required once year on the day of atonement but he's doing it twice a week he's trying to show that he's good he's he's talking about how he tithes and the tithes was above and beyond what was required again it was required that you would tithe of your flocks and you would requ- you would tithe of your your crops but he's going no 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 even the product of my flocks I'll, I'll give a tithe on that so I'm, I'm doing better than the 10 before but it's ironic because the very thing that he's arguing that he has done so well at is the very things that God never required him to do. God didn't require him to go above and beyond. God asked for one day a year for the Jews on the Day of Atonement to fast. Not that they would do it every every Monday and Thursday, every Tuesday and Thursday. Like, he's, he's arguing that he is so good based off of what God never asked his people to do. But ironically, he is also at the same time completely missing what God did ask his children to do. Because Jesus summed up all of the law and all of the prophets in two commandments, to love God and to love others. So while he is boasting in his accomplishments of what God didn't ask him to do, he's blatantly ignoring what God did ask him to do, which was to love God and to love others. He is completely missing the point here. (laughs) And and I wrote this down. I I said this. The purpose of this parable is to show one cannot trust in oneself for righteousness. The Pharisee's prayer was concerned with telling God that what a good man that he was. For he not only kept the law uh, of fasting and praying, but also considered himself better than others. He was using other people as his standard for measuring righteousness. The problem is, is that comparison is a trap. And about six years ago, there's a teaching by Andy Stanley, who I think is a phenomenal communicator, and it's still around to this day. In fact, I think it's kind of changed or morphed maybe even into uh, like a women's devotional, or you can find it on Right Now Media. But the comparison trap was something that was, uh, I thought was a great message that was communicated again by Andy Stanley. And and his argument in uh, in the comparison trap is that when you compare, like when, uh, let me get it right, I want to say that uh, comparison is a trap. There's no win in comparison. So he, he's making this point that we kind of live in the land of Ur. So when we look at other people, we can kind of judge and compare what we have versus what they have, and they could be richer or smarter or um, more attractive or more successful, or they can be kind of the Ur that we're looking for. We live in the land of Ur, but when we do that, what we're actually doing is taking our eyes off of what God has given us, and now we're comparing it to other people. And, and this is what I wrote down just kind of as a summary of that comparison trap. When we start to compare to what others have, we take our eyes off of the master and we put it on ourselves. There's only two outcomes to comparison. You either come out looking great, full of pride, which is what our, our Pharisee is doing, or we fall short and we feel like God owes you. So if you're comparing your life, your, your career to others' career, stop comparing because there's no win in comparison. And so that's what this Pharisee is doing. He is comparing himself to other people. And man, he's coming out looking great. He's coming out going, man, I am nailing it. I am crushing it. And it leads to this pride. It leads to the self-righteousness of going, man, I've arrived. And the Pharisee's approach, or excuse me, the tax collector's approach is completely different. The tax collector's approach is one of humility, not one of pride, not one of boasting, not one of bragging or or bravado. He is not listing all of his accomplishments and the things that he's done, but he actually is going to God and seeking mercy. Joe is missing the point. G.I. Joe, the Pharisee, Joe is missing the point. And, and the reality is, even if everything that he prayed is true, like even if he was such a good guy, and even if he's doing all of these things, and even if this guy was so bad, the problem is he's still comparing his life to someone else's. And here's the deal. When you compare your life to a perfect and holy and just God, you will fall short every single time. 
he's comparing to the wrong person because he's looking at other people that he can score really well on his comparison to. But if he was to actually look at who God is and what God has done, there's no way that he wins that matchup because God is perfect. God is the one who is, is sovereign and is in control. And the, Jesus had come to establish the kingdom of God here on earth. Continuing on, this, uh, this next verse says this. It says, uh, verse 13, we've got about two more to go. Uh, it says this, But the tax collector, standing far off, would not even lift up his eyes to heaven, but beat his breast, saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. Be merciful to me, a sinner. So again, what we have is Joe who's bragging. Uh, we have this Pharisee who's bragging, saying he's got it all together, using his own merit, comparing himself to somebody that's lower and inferior he believes is lower and more inferior than him and he's bragging but then we have the tax collector who maybe is broken he's humbled he's lowly he's he's approaching god in, in a way that's going i don't have it all together the reality is is that he probably has stolen from people he is probably taking advantage of of people that he can he probably has a lot of wealth and a lot of riches and probably not very many friends and he's looking at his life going man I, i've missed it I've done wrong. I've hurt the people that I love. I've hurt my countrymen. And so his approach to, to this prayer, coming to God, was, was not one of self-righteousness, but one of humility, one of humbling himself and realizing that he missed it. And the tax collector was using God as his measure of standing, or a measure of comparing. So he's comparing not to other people, but he's comparing himself to a perfect and holy and just God. And when he does that, he sees how, fall, how short he has fallen. And so continuing on, he, he takes this posture of humility. In that time and in that day, standing with eyes, uh, eyes up and hands lifted high to heaven was a common kind of uh, posture of prayer. So what we see the Pharisee doing is kind of lifting his, his head and his hands to, in prayer, going, God, I thank you. But here this, this tax collector is not looking up. He's not raising his hands to God. He's not kind of making a scene. He's just kind of shrinking back. Beating his chest would have been a sign of remorse and, and grieving in that time. And, and whenever there was confession, that was kind of a, a sign of mourning that they, the Jews would do. So he is in a season of mourning, repenting the fact that he, is, he has missed it. And that word mercy in, in 18... Uh, 13. It says, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. That word mercy means making reconciliation by sacrifice, uh, by sacrificing only uh, by sacrifice. And it's only used one other time in the New Testament. It's a very interesting word that is there. If you've been around church world for a while, there's a word called propitiation, where Jesus basically takes our place, he takes our sin, and we get his righteousness. And that is basically this word of what is happening there, that propitiation. Uh, to, to read kind of if you look up a, uh, chapter 18, 13 in lexicon, it says this, propitiation, appeasement, or satisfaction of divine wrath on sin. Properly to extend propitiation, showing mercy by satisfying, literally propitiating the wrath of God on sin to reconcile, appease, and propitiate. It, it's a very interesting word that is used there. He is literally calling out to God for salvation. He's going, God, would you replace my my unfilthy or my filthy unrighteousness with your righteousness. Would you take away, would you have mercy, would you show grace because I need it? Uh, this is one of the, uh, another thing by the NIV uh, application commentary. It says the tax collector does not stand up but approaches God with a sense of distance. He does not look up to heaven, a sign of contrition, but beats his breast, fully aware that he approaches God as a sinner. His prayer is different. God, have mercy on me, a sinner. There is no self-congratulation. There's no summary of his good deeds. There's no sense that God ought to feel honored or obligated to the, the petitioner. But there is one recognition, his need for God's mercy. His request for mercy uses a Greek word that translates into the Hebrew word meaning to cover. Its background and use assume that the petitioner cannot earn forgiveness, so he simply makes an appeal for God's forgiving compassion. He comes to God designed only to improve his relationship. 
And so verse 14, as we kind of round out this, this passage, this is what Jesus says in, in giving this parable. This is how it ends. He says, I tell you, this man went down to his house justified. That word justified there means, uh, it means that God's act of declaring people not guilty of sin. He was justified. He was made right. He was, he was sanctified even in that moment that, God, that Jesus justified him. I tell you that this man went to his house justified rather than the other. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, but the one who humbles himself will be exalted. Three months ago, when, when I was sharing with you a passage that was almost similar to this, it was where the uh, Pharisees were jockeying for power and position at, at this meal on the Sabbath, and they try and trick Jesus, but they're, they're really looking for power and prominence. That's where G.I. Joe first showed up, he and his other people as they jockeyed for position. And here what we see is almost the same word-for-word -word verse where Jesus says, for everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, but the one who humbles himself will be exalted. And the word-for-word -word translation of 1411, which was that other text that we looked at several months ago, it says, for anyone who exalts himself will be humbled, and he who humbles himself will be exalted. This is not new for anybody working through the book of Luke. If you've been here, you've probably heard this. There's even more. I can give you, in 1330, Jesus says, And behold, some who are last will be first, and some who are first will be last. And then in 948, the, the disciples are arguing about who would be the greatest in the kingdom of, of God, like who of, among the disciples. Jesus kind of grabs a kid and says, You need to be like a child. And then he ends it by saying, For he who is least among you all is the one who is great. And then in 620, this is kind of the Sermon on the Mount where Jesus is talking about blessed are the poor in spirit or the translation of that word. It says, and he lifted up his eyes on his disciples and said, blessed are you who are poor. And again, poor there, this is, it says in spirit, those devout of, uh, of spiritual arrogance, those who regard themselves as insignificant. Blessed are you who are poor for yours is the kingdom of God. And then even if you trace it all the way back to Luke chapter 1, where, where, where the angel tells Mary that she will give birth. As a virgin, she will give birth to a son, and he is the Messiah. Even in her response, in her song, in her thanksgiving to God, she declares this in 151. He has brought down rulers from their thrones and exalted those who were humble. This is a reoccurring theme, and honestly, you're probably going to see it again. <laughs> So as we continue through this Luke series, if you're getting tired of hearing us talk about humility versus pride, there's a reason that, God, that Jesus chose to speak about this so much. Because I think what happens is that the danger for us is actually not that we've been so lost in sin, but that we become so self-righteous that we think we can earn it on our own. The more dangerous place of the two is to think that you have arrived, and therefore you miss what God has for you. So there's a reason that God, that Jesus brings it up time and time and time again. Yes, it's for the Pharisees as, as he's continu continuing to travel and minister. But guess what? It's also for us today. It's also a reminder for us today to walk in not pride, but to walk in humility. To be like, uh, to be more like the tax collector. To be like G.I. Joe, or to be like Lego guy. Sorry, I'm getting confused up here. Than to be like G.I. Joe or the Pharisee. That's what Jesus is calling us to do. Uh, another comment or commentary said this. Uh, I think it's the NIV study Bible. It says this. Uh, Jesus' comment closed this passage. He endorses his collector's humility. The one justified before God, the one whose prayer is heard, is not that of the religious man with all of his works. The prayer God hears is the call for mercy. Jesus explains why. Those who exalt themselves will be humbled, while the humble will be lifted up. Bravado and appearance mean nothing. Resume and social status mean nothing. Self-reliance means nothing. What counts is a heart that appreciates what God can give. The tax collector, therefore, is the one whom Jesus says goes home justified. In seeking God's forgiveness, he receives it. The lesson of Luke 18, 9 through 14, emerges through the contrast of pride to humility. Pride preaches merit. Humility pleads for compassion. Pride negotiates as an equal. Humility approaches in need. Pride separates by putting down others. Humility identifies with others. Recognizing that we all have the same need. Pride destroys through its alienating self-service. Humility opens the door with its power to sympathize with the struggles we share. 
Proud pride turns up its nose. Humility offers an open and lifted up hand. So my challenge for you as we kind of wrap up, as we start to move on, is, is that we would be people that walk in pride. Not pride, but walk in humility. Wow, that was a, a wrong, it was a terrible misspeak, right? <laughs> Let me try that again. We would walk in humility, there it is, and not pride, right? Because again, this is the lesson that we see time and time and time and time again. And here's what I would caution you. If you're sitting in your seat and you're going, I can't think of any pride that I have. This message is for you. <laughs> I think that we as people will wrestle with pride. There is this tendency, like I said, that as, as we live into the church world, as we become more secure, as we walk in, in hopefully faithfulness and, and dedication to God, that we can kind of sway from a place of, of looking for God for mercy to almost feeling like God maybe deserves to, to give this to us. And we just need to be careful and guarded that we aren't people of pride but we are people of humility and that we actually accept God's grace. And what I would say is that we accept his gift each and every single day. So as this Christmas season comes, as, as we get close to, to uh, unwrapping presents, as we get close to kind of exchanging of gifts, the, the desire and the goal is that you would first and foremost open up the gift that God gives to us every single day that you would open up and you would receive his grace, that you would receive his mercy, and that you wouldn't try and do it by works, that you wouldn't try and do it by your good things that you do or your merit or earning it, but that you would just receive his gift. What, what I want to do kind of as we, as we wrap up, I wanted to give the opportunity for anybody that maybe hasn't accepted Christ as, as Lord and Savior. Maybe for you today, you're, you're here as we get close to Christmas. Maybe you were asked to come. Maybe you're back from school. Maybe you're, you're watching online, just kind of hanging out. Maybe you're just even listening to this later via podcast or whatever. But I, I truly believe that God has in store for us something great and amazing, and he wants to offer to us this gift today. Not just something that he does once or twice, but he offers it to us every single day. So in just a moment, what I'm going to ask is that we're going to kind of bow our head in prayer. And I don't want to lead you in the exact words to speak, but I just want to kind of give you some prompts. And if you desire to receive God's gift of righteousness, if you desire to receive him as Lord and Savior, then you can say these words either out loud or, out loud or simply in your mind. You don't even have to speak it out. God knows your heart. He sees your heart. And if that's your desire, then you can, you can receive him today. And the worship team is going to go ahead and make its way on out. They're going to uh, get ready for this. But I would encourage you that if you are in a place where you would want to receive that, then today don't let this opportunity, don't let this moment go by without taking the time to accept and to receive God's gift. In the hustle and bustle of the season, again, the whole point of this series is that we would not just in, in that chaos and that craziness and all of the things that are happening, that we wouldn't just be kind of forgetting about what God has done, but we would have an expectation of his moving, that we would have a perseverance in prayer and a growth of faith. And that third thing, as we discussed today, that we would accept and receive his gift that he freely offers. So today, if that is you, if you have the desire to receive him, we're just going to bow our heads in, in prayer. And again, you can either speak that out just in your mind. You can speak it softly to yourself. Uh, I'm going to ask if we can just maybe play the piano or something softly right now. That would be great. But there's nothing significant about the words, just in the sense that you are humbling yourself to the point where you want to receive Christ as your Lord and Savior. So I would just ask, with every head bowed, every eye closed, whether you're in the parking lot, you're at home, or in this building, I would ask you to just bow your head and close your eyes. Not that there's anything powerful or significant about that, but that you would just kind of not be distracted by what's going on. And again, I'm just going to simply give you prompts and so this morning, in your own words, what I would ask you is if you are wanting to accept Christ as your Lord and Savior, that you would confess your wrongdoings and your pride. Confess the areas of sin and where you've missed the mark. So go ahead and do that right now in your own words. Next, what I'd ask you to do is admit that you can't be good enough on your own, that you understand and need Jesus as Lord, that you need his gift that he offers of righteousness.
next prompt would be that you would ask God to come into your life and to become your Lord and Savior and to teach you what it means to be a disciple of him. Next, what I would ask you to do is to thank him that he didn't just die on a cross, but that he rose again to life. And now because of that, we can experience true life. And then the last prompt is, I would ask that you would learn to put your trust, ask him that you would learn to put your trust in God and to grow in a knowledge of him. Father, I thank you for each and every single person that is here. Lord, in this room, you know those that have asked you to be their, their Lord and Savior. Lord, you know those in the parking lot and those that are online, those that are listening to this months, weeks, years, even after this, this initial podcast or initial speaking, Lord. I pray that you would just allow them to feel your power and your Holy Spirit right now in the name of Jesus. Lord, I thank you that you are a good father. Lord, that you give us gifts. Lord, that we have the opportunity to accept that. Lord, there is nothing that we can do to earn that. There is no works that we can do that would justify ourselves on our own. But Lord, you freely offer us your gift of salvation. So Lord, I pray for each and every single person today that accepted you as, as Lord and Savior the very first time. I pray that you would make yourself real to them. Lord, that this would be a Christmas season that they would be so excited for what you have done, what you did by sending Jesus to this earth in the form of a child. As we, as we celebrate it this week, Lord God, would we be mindful of what that means and how it impacts our life. Lord, I, I thank you that there's today those that have rededicated their life. Those that have said, Lord, maybe I've missed it, but I want to come back to you. Lord, I pray that they would open that gift once again. Lord, I thank you that you were full of grace, that you were full of mercy. I pray that we would live our lives in humility and not in pride. Lord, I thank you for this parable. I thank you for this example that you give. Lord, would we just simply walk in who you've called us to be? Would we walk in humility and to pursue after you? Lord, I thank you for it. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, we don't do this every week, but um, we're going to sing a song called O Come All Ye Unfaithful this week. Um, and we're going to have some people from the prayer team that will be up here available to pray. And if you've prayed that prayer today, um, I would invite you to come up. But, um, you know, as Ben was talking through this gift, I think sometimes even as believers, we open the gift, we receive it, and then we kind of shelve it, right? We forget what God has offered to us. And so if you're, if you're weak or unstable today, if you are bitter or broken, I would invite you to come. Um, you can pray with someone. You can just come to the altar and give it back over to God because I believe that. Um, and, and outside, just so you know, there's going to be someone in the parking lot available to pray. If you're watching online, you can actually type pray in the chat or, or direct message us and, and uh, you leave us our, your phone number. Someone can call you back. Um, I don't want you to walk out of this church today and into the work week uh, thinking that you have to carry all that with you uh, because Christ came so you, that you don't. <laughs> and so if you have an opportunity to come and kneel before God and hand that over to him, that would be my prayer uh, for you this morning. So prayers, if you would be available up at the front, I think one of them will be here shortly. Um, I invite you to come. Oh, come, oh, you unfaithful, come. Weak and unstable, come. No, you are not alone. Oh, come, barren and weighty ones, weary of praying, come. See what your God has done. Christ is born, Christ is born, Christ is born, 
prayer today and this week is that you would actually do what we were talking about today, that you would walk in humility and not walk in pride. And I know that for some, if you want to stay in this moment, in this kind of attitude of prayer, I know that the prayers would be happy to pray with you if you're looking for prayer. Um, but I also want to say that if you maybe accepted Christ as Lord and Savior, either as a rededication or as a first time, we would love to be able to connect with you. And this does take a little bit more uh, boldness. If you would be willing to uh, grab one of our connect cards, either do that in the lobby after the service or if you're online in the parking lot or just prefer uh, virtually if you go to clcfamily.church slash connect. Just fill out one of those forms. I would love to be able to, to connect with you personally if you have any questions or if any any thoughts. I would love that opportunity to do that. But I want to challenge you this week as it's kind of in the final week countdown of Christmas in the hustle and bustle. Don't miss and, and, and don't forget that that we get the opportunity to look forward with expectation that God is on the move, that we get the opportunity to be persistent in prayer because it strengthens and grows our faith, and that we also get to accept this free gift of God's righteousness. So we hope that you have a blessed week. I'm going to just simply kind of say uh, Romans 15, 3 or 13 over you as we kind of dismiss in prayer. But I do want to remind you, if you're interested in joining us for either of our Christmas Eve services, we have one at 5 and at 7 this week. But let me just say this as a closing prayer over you today. As again, Romans 15, 13, may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing so that by the power of the Holy Spirit, you may abound in hope. Amen. We hope that you have a great week, everyone. We'll see you.